One night, I read this story, one night a, a house caught on fire. A young boy was forced to leave his room and leave the house by the roof. Sad thing was his dad was on the ground. Here's this young boy on the roof. He can't come through the house. It's engulfed in fire. The only way to get to safety is to jump off the roof. His dad is on the ground, and his dad yells to him without straight arms, jump, I'll catch you. He knew the boy had to jump if he was going to save his life. But all the boy could see was a flame, flames of fire, smoke, and blackness. Now, as you can imagine, the young boy was terrified to jump off the roof of the house. But his dad kept yelling, jump, I'll catch you. And the boy yells back at his dad and says, I can't see you. His father says, but I can see you. And that's all that matters. The father was asking his son to put his life in his father's hand. He was asking his son to trust him. I, I just want to ask this as fathers, should we expect our children to have that kind of faith in us, to trust us with their lives? Well, let me ask this. Should we teach them how to trust? Amen. I would say it's our responsibility as fathers to teach our children how to trust us. Rather than us just, because I'm your daddy, you trust me. That's not going to fit. You know, when I grew up, I grew up in a time where days I said so. It meant something. That's right. You know, my generation has messed that up. My generation and generations behind me, we've just really thrown that out the window. Now kids ask why a whole lot more often. But I wonder if it's to help us, if God's allowed that to take place, to help us to understand our responsibility as fathers is to teach our children how to trust us. Or teach them that they can, in fact, trust us. Well, the best way that I can suggest that we teach them is to demonstrate our faith and trust in our Heavenly Father with our own lives. That is the best way that we can teach our children that they can trust us. Because by demonstrating this, we are teaching them that not only are we trustworthy, but that our Heavenly Father is the one who is leading us to be trustworthy. And it's teaching them that because we are trusting God with our lives, that they can trust us with their lives, because their lives would also be in the hand of our God. So now the real question is, how do fathers demonstrate to their children their faith in the Lord? Well, James helps us with this because James is dealing with an issue <coughs> that Christians even today deal with. The Bible tells us here in James 2, 21 through 24, it tells us, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works, and not by faith only. Now this is God's holy word. God, as we come before you today, we pray that you would speak to our hearts through your word. We pray, God, that through the study and meditation of our hearts, God, that you would pour out your words to us. And God, as you do, help us to be receptive of what you have to teach us. Help us as fathers, God, to see our responsibility to have a faith that is alive. A faith, God, that is moving. A faith that is doing what you would have it to do. 
help us, God, to demonstrate this before our children so that our children would see who you would have us to be. And God, we pray that in the midst of everything that's said and done today, that you're glorified and your son is magnified. We pray, God, if there's one with us today that doesn't know you through your son, Jesus Christ, that this day, this Father's Day, that God, this would be a new day for them, that they would cry out, what must I do to be saved? That this day they would give their life to you through your, by receiving your son, Jesus Christ. And this day, may they see life anew as they walk in a different light, in a new light, a light that you prepare for them. And God, we'll praise you for all that's accomplished. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Now, in today's text, James addresses the proof of our faith. That's what he's dealing with, proof of our faith. James begins by asking the question, what does it profit if someone says he has faith but not have works? Now, we must understand that James is not advocating at this time that we are saved by faith plus works. That's not what James is saying. No... Because we can find in scripture that Paul has shared with the Ephesian believers that by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So this brings the question, what is James actually asking? Well, it, it appears that he is saying, how can we be a light in this world by saying that we have faith, but we have no works. By saying we have faith, but we have no works, our faith is not being demonstrated. It's not being shown to the world. So to the world, what we say actually means nothing. And when we say we have faith, but there's no demonstration of that faith, then to the world, our words are dead. You all understand that. Ladies, is it enough for a man to say, I love you? You know, if he says, I love you, then beats on you. He has no works to prove that he loves you. Right? So you, after a while, if all that happens is he says, I love you, but he never shows you he loves you. After a while, you're going to begin to question, does he really love me or are those empty words? Well, that's the way it is for a Christian. Today, if we tell the world, well, I have faith in God, but there's no demonstration of that faith in God, then our faith is dead to the world. You know, this is an issue that's facing so many of us today, but truly many Christians, well, maybe not those who are here at Reedy Branch. Maybe not those who are watching on our YouTube page or, or our Facebook page. But just in case, just in case there is one, we know there are many professing Christians in this world. They profess Jesus Christ as their Savior, but their lives or how they live their lives, it doesn't demonstrate it. It says something else. Are, are y'all with me? So for many professing Christians today, their faith is actually in question. When, and when there's no demonstration of faith in a believer, then not only is their faith called into question, but also their character. And their integrity is called into question. So this should never be the case for a father. There's just too much at stake for a father to have his faith, his character, or his integrity in question. So here today, James gives us an example of a godly father whose faith is being demonstrated. And James provides us with this illustration of Abraham. And in this illustration, what we see is a faith that has been proven perfect. The Bible tells us here that uh, James here asked that question there in verse 21. Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? The misleading uh, of this verse uh, 
is that some view this question as a suggestion of that we're justified by words. But that's not what James is saying. Instead, he is saying that the words of Abraham, they, in fact, they, the fact that Abraham obeyed God and was willing to offer up his son Isaac was a demonstration of his faith. So in actuality, James could have said Abraham's faith in God was justified by his willingness to obey God and offer Isaac, his son, on the altar. In other words, Abraham's faith was a justification to those who were witnessing his life. And because Abraham's faith was justified by works, his faith was made perfect. The word perfect here carries the meaning of complete or finished. Abraham's faith was proven and or it was shown to be a complete faith. Folks, a, a true and a living faith works. Understand what I'm saying. It works. It, it is busy. It is doing something. A true and a living faith is moving. It's being demonstrated. It, it completes and it finishes its course. If a faith does not work or act or complete or finish its course, it's a dead faith. It's an incomplete, unfinished, and unproven faith. So now the question comes to us as fathers. If we demonstrate to our children, our sons and daughters, whether they are young or whether they are adults, if we demonstrate to them an incomplete, unfinished, unproven faith, how can we expect them to trust us? We can't. We can't. You know, maybe this helps us a little bit. Faith honors God and God honors faith. And there's this story of missionaries, Robert and Mary Moffat. It illustrates this truth. Ten years, this couple labored. And they labored faithfully on the mission field of what's called now Botswana. Uh, without one single convert, for ten years, they remained faithful. Finally, the directors of the mission board began to question the wisdom of them continuing to serve in a place to where there's no gain of it. A place where no one is receiving the word of God. But the thought of leaving where they were at, it troubled this couple. They, wanted, they just really believed that God was in the midst of their work there in Botswana. But the thought of leaving there, um, it just troubled them. So they stayed. Another year went by. Another two years went by. And they were still trusting the Lord. And then Miss Moffat, she got a, a letter from a friend back over in Europe. And when she got that letter from this friend... She asked, is there anything that we can send y'all? <laughs> she didn't ask for a plane ticket. Instead, she asked for a communion set. No converts in 12 years. And she's asking for a communion set. She just believed being in the will of God and obeying God rather than man, that they would see the fruit of their labor. And just... When the communion set was to arrive, six people received Christ as their Savior. And these six began the first church in Botswana because they continued to exercise their faith. Well, <laughs> their faith was proven. In that they continued to labor, trusting in the Lord, even when it wasn't popular. Even in a place to where he wasn't popular, they continued to trust the Lord. They continued to obey him. So I have to ask our fathers, has your children seen a proven faith in your life? Has your children seen a faith that works in your life? 
Can I ask it this way? Has your children seen your faith in such a way that they could tell others that they've seen your faith in action? Have they seen you trust the Lord when trusting him wasn't popular? Have they seen you trust the Lord when, when, uh, when he wasn't popular? Do they see that you trust his promises and his plan for your life? Too many have compromised with this world in order to keep from losing a job, in order to keep a position that they have, in order to keep the popularity that they're engulfed with. Some have even compromised to save relationships, whether it be with coworkers, whether it be with friends, or even with our families. We've been willing to compromise the truth of God's word. But Isaiah 5 and 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet or sweet for bitter. So, fathers, I, if we want our children to trust us, then we must see that we are to have an unwavering faith. That works. A faith that is proven perfect. Not that we're sinless. We're never going to be sinless as long as we're on this side of life. But that we trust the Lord Jesus Christ knows what's best for us. And we follow him. This is, that is the proven faith. That's a perfect faith. Well, we can know that our faith is proven perfect. When our faith satisfies scripture. Now Abraham's faith. It satisfied or it fulfilled. The scripture. What scripture? Genesis 15 and 6 says that he believed the Lord. And he accounted it to him. For righteousness. Abraham had no heir. But in chapter 12 of Genesis, we find that God promised Abraham that his descendants would be given the land of Canaan. And by chapter 15, Abraham was still without an heir or at least one from his own body. But in Genesis 15 and 5, God told Abraham to look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to Abraham, so shall your descendants be. This was declared 30 years before what James is speaking about. 30 years before. This was declared to Abraham by God 30 years before Abraham had a son or had the promised son. The words, it was before, well, let me put it, it was 30 years before Abraham offered up Isaac. God pronounced that Abraham was justified. This meant that Abraham was saved 30 years before he ever took Isaac up and offered him as a sacrifice to God. So James is declaring that when Abraham offered Isaac, he was proving his faith. In fact, Abraham would not have offered Isaac up if he had not already believed in God. He believed, therefore he did what God said. And we know the scriptures have been written and we know that we are not adding to them. So now we, how, so we have to ask ourselves, how can we satisfy scripture? Well, in John 14 and 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if we believe Christ, we will do what he says. We will follow him. But if we do not obey Christ or obey his commands, if we do not follow him, then simply we do not believe him. Our faith or our, our professed faith is in vain when we would rather follow our own path than the path that he has ordered for us. Psalm 37 and, and 23 says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. God told Abraham this in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. He told Abraham this and what did Abraham do? He went to packing. He went to pack and demonstrating that he believed God. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And because of this, because he believed God, because he'd done what God said do, 
<laughs> Abraham was called a friend to God. Boy, is there any other title that you could ever have in this world <laughs> better than a friend of God? You can reach the pinnacle of the, of the president of the United States if you want to think that's a pinnacle. You can be the president of whatever company that you build. You can be whatever you want to be in this world. But if you're not a friend of God, then you haven't reached the best place that you could be. Amen. God's word tells us that if we will trust him, that he will fulfill all our desires. Look, listen at what he told Abraham. He said, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land I'll show you and I'll make you a great nation. You want to be part of a great nation? Be part of the family of God. He says that I'll bless you and make your name great. If you want to have a great name, put Christian in front of your name and live that life to where people see that you are a Christian. He says here that you shall be a blessing and I'm just convinced that if we're exercising our faith, that we're going to bless others. But he also said he would bless those who bless us. And he would curse those who curse us. You ever get tired of fighting in this world? Well, if we just trust the Lord, he'll do all the fighting for us. He's promised us that. And in us, in us, our families will be blessed. Fathers, we have a great responsibility. We have a great responsibility, and that is that we obey God's word. Well, his word tells us in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He's telling us that if we would believe in him, then we can have everlasting life. His word tells us in Romans 3 and 23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because we have sinned, Romans 6 and 23 also tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So in Romans 10 and 9, he says if, that we're told that if we confess our sins, confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. In Romans 10 and 13 tells us that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So fathers, let me ask you, do you believe this? Do you believe this? If you believe this, why not demonstrate your faith in this? If you believe... If you will believe God's word and put your faith in, into action and follow his son, Jesus Christ, as your savior by faith, you will obey his word. It will be accounted to you as righteousness. And then your faith will demonstrate to your children that they can trust you. And just maybe, just maybe one day they'll trust this same Christ. As their savior. Just as you have. So. As every head's bowed. Every eye's closed. For those of you who are saved. Why not recommit today. Fathers. Mothers. Sons and daughters. Singles. Married. Wherever you are in this life, if you are saved, why not recommit today to trust the Lord more and to demonstrate your faith in him more than ever before? Oh, I would say that while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, that you would, you would make that commitment right now, that you would talk to God, acknowledging Areas of your life where you haven't followed him. Where you haven't trusted him. And just recommit to him. This Father's Day. June 19th, 2022. That you're just going to recommit your life to him. To trust in him. 
so that you can be an example of a godly father, a man of faith, a woman of faith to your children, to your brothers, to your sisters, to your family, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your co-workers. And for those of you who are not saved, why not let today be the day that you, by faith, Give your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. And let today be the first day of the rest of your life obeying his word. You can start just by following that Roman road. Call upon the name of the Lord. And today, he'll give you a new life. Would you? As they sing this song, is there one that would say, I'm ready to have a new life today?